I keep getting asked to do a complete video walkthrough on how to make one of my watch dials. And so that's what this video is, is how to make this watch dial that I'm showing here. So probably the first step and really an important process, part of the process before you get started is how big does your watch dial need to be? And that's going to depend on the case that you're using. Now, cases are going to have published watch dial sizes when you purchase them, um, or you can measure them. But what you're going to measure is the case space above that ridge that you see right there. And so it's going to be the width of that area um, that that way the watch dial is going to sit right on top of there. Now, the best thing to do is have that watch dial snug against the case so it just fits. And that will absolutely keep your movement from moving as well um, once it's attached. I'm going to be making the watch dials out of these brass blanks and I'm going to use calipers to measure and it's going to be 33 millimeters. 32.93 uh, was the first measurement I took and then when I remeasure again I'm going to get 33 and some change but 33 millimeters is the size of this case that I need to make the watch dial. Now, as far as design goes, I didn't really have any specific design in mind. I just made this one up on the fly. And it just happens to be a 3D sliced image of a part of the moon, the lunar surface, um, that I turned into a uh, 3D sliced um, compatible file. Um, and so you can see here it's 33 millimeters. And when I look at the slice data for the laser, um, you can see here that I've set it to 300 total passes um, with a 3D slice, 60,000 millimeters per um, minute, and a power, I think, of 75 with a minimum of 20. Um, here you can see I did 40 passes for the outer ring, and then for these red dots, uh, which are going to be holes for the pips and also for the center, um, I did 6,000 uh, with an 80% power and um, that's what I did there. Anyway, so those settings are really important, actually. And uh, one thing I've learned since making this dial is that uh, doing a smaller uh, line interval is actually really important for these 3D slices. And what I'm going to be using in the future is probably a 0.03 line interval with a 0.04 dot size um, for 3D sliced images. Um, but uh, you can go up higher than that if you'd like. And it's like on this one, I think I used a 0.06 or a 0.07 um, and it still turned out just fine. Um, because I don't like putting anything polished in, I'm always going to use a rough material to give it a brushed or satin finish. I already did it on this one, but that's what I would have done is just pushed it against there and rub rubbed it up back and forth until I got a nice satin finish so that the laser doesn't reflect up. I failed to do that once had a brightly polished surface and it ended up and reflected the laser and melted the top of my enclosure, um, which was just made of vinyl. Um, I use this uh, little uh, chuck to put my stuff in. Um, it's good for holding it and it also dissipates some of the heat, um, but you don't have to use that. I also have vices that I've used. Um, you can also lay it directly on the bed. Um, here I'm just setting the focal length. This is supposed to be where the line is. You can see that's about 18 millimeters. And uh, so I'm going to do that. I always adjust the focus once the job starts though, so I can get the strongest laser focus. Um, you can tell that just by the way the light's hitting and reacting with the medium that you're trying to engrave. So we're going to get the brass blank aligned where it needs to be by using the laser marks that the system is putting down. And then we'll get it started and get this brass blank engraved. When you get a Galvo laser, fiber laser, you're going to calibrate it and make sure that one millimeter is one millimeter on the output for the job. I've already done that on this, so I don't need to measure this to make sure it's going to be 33 millimeters because I already know my Galvo laser is calibrated. So if it's showing 33 millimeters in light burn, it's going to be 33 millimeters on the output. Um, and that's something that you end up setting up when you set up your, uh, your, your fiber laser. Um, one of the uh, parts here that you can see just on these scanning passes, it's going through and it's making that outer chapter area. Um, and I'm not going to cover 
watching this through the whole thing. I'm just talking through a little bit of it. Um, but you can see I'm changing the angle every time. And that's going to let the pattern that's on the brass um, be a little bit smoother and less of a like crosshatch pattern. And so I really recommend you do that. Um, and I usually just change it by 12 degrees. Um, depending on what you're doing, though, you may want that pattern. And so you may have a reason to keep it at a specific um, a specific angle. And what I'm doing here is called a cross hatch. So it's going one way and then going the opposite way across that as well. And then by shifting that by 12 degrees, I'm giving a little bit smoother. Here, this is that 6,000 uh, millimeter per minute speed. And this is, I'm actually putting holes through um, the, uh, the brass here. So it's going all the way through. Now, when at first I set this as fill all shapes at once, that's not what I meant to do. I meant to actually set it to fill each shape separately. And it's about to change over to that mode here. And you're going to see how that just punches right through the brass. Um, I am sure it would make it through if I just did that, but you can see the big difference here just by doing each one individually. You can see the red light already coming through and um, putting a hole all the way through the brass. Now, I'm not too worried about these holes being uniform or even being complete. I always go back and I make these holes exactly the size I want them using my vertical mill um, in my workshop. Um, however, if you don't have a vertical mill, the laser is absolutely positively able to put in the holes that you need through whatever you need to move. Um, but I always prefer to do it on my mill. So I make these a little bit smaller and then mill them out to the exact size I need. Here it's going to uh, start the 3D slicing or engraving. And um, you can already see here the, uh, the Barger logo is already showing up. And that's because I put that in a brighter color towards the top so that it would start doing that. Now, one of the things I could have done that would have made this a much better um, engraving is I could have set the line interval to 0 0.02 and the dot size to 0 0.03. That would have given it a nice set of overlap, um, made it a much smoother engraving, and ended up giving me um, also a lower power, and then given me a much um, higher resolution engraving. Of course, that would have uh, taken longer to do, um, and in this case, since I'm simply doing this just for tutorial of making a dial, um, and I'm not planning on using this dial for anything, um, I'll just use this faster setting so I can get this knocked out faster. You can see here that the detail on the 3D slice turned out really nicely, and um, this is going to need a cleaning pass. The cleaning pass is just a higher speed, lower power, higher frequency pass that cleans off the burned areas. You can do cleaning passes throughout your job, and for some materials like stainless steel, for instance, it's really important that after two or three passes, you run your cleaning pass. Um, otherwise, you're going to end up with a very uh, set-in scorch that will be difficult to get rid of. But with brass, it's actually pretty easy uh, just to run a cleaning pass at the end, um, and it cleans it up really well. What I did here is I just duplicated the outer edge. I'm going to turn off all of the other layers so they don't output, and then I'm going to head back in real quick just to make sure that I remember to turn off the wobble for this. Wobble slows things down quite a bit, and if you leave it on, even at low power, um, it can really create um, something that could ruin your dial. So it's really important to do that. So I'm just setting at a high speed, a uh, minimum power and 100 frequency here. And then of course that wobble, I need to make sure is good too. Number of passes is how many times I'm gonna do it. And then I'm gonna do a cross hatch pattern as well when I'm cleaning. You're gonna wanna make sure that the wobble is turned off. That otherwise could ruin the dial if you do try to clean it with wobble turned on. And then you're just gonna start the cleaning pass. And let's take a look at what that cleaning pass is going to look like. And this is a pretty strong cleaning pass, actually. I would prefer it to be a little less uh, power than this. Um, but it's doing what it needs to do. It's removing all of the charred or burned areas of it. And so we'll go ahead and let it finish up. And then we'll need to cut the dial out of the brass. So I haven't done any circular cuts on this yet. Um, and I need to do that at least 
uh, 20 or 30 rotations around it so that um, I will be able to get this out of the frame that I'm going to leave it in. I always leave my dials in the frame while I'm finishing them. Um, I found that if I try to take them out of that frame before, um, I can end up losing some of the edge detail um, during some of the polishing um, or sanding parts. In this case, I made it out a 0 0.05 millimeters out from the original size. Um, later on, you're going to see that this key, that keeps this from fitting into the watch dial, and I end up having to uh, sand or uh, bring that down using a sanding medium. Um, and so, um, which is no big deal. Taking off 0.05 millimeters is pretty easy to do, but just food for thought. Um, if you've made something exactly the size you need it and you add 0 0.05 to it, you may find that it's not going to work. Now the cutting edge on this, I do it very low, very slow. Um, I typically will do it at 75 or 80%. Um, I'm trying to use my laser at 75% or less just because, um, Otherwise, it gets pretty hot on the components inside of the system, and that can actually cause my laser to fail sooner, even though the laser itself may still work. Um, so I just did, in this case, I think I did 40 of those. Uh, maybe I did 20. I can't remember. Um, but the main thing is you just want it to be scored on the back, and uh, this is how this looks when it gets finished here. You can see it kind of has a really... Um, very matty looking finish to it and this is the back of it that I'm looking for and I want to be able to see those scores coming all the way through the back otherwise this is not going to come out of that frame uh, when I bend it apart so literally when I get ready to take that out you'll see how I do that um, I'm going to use spray paint on this and I'm using a um, an antique brass spray paint made by Bear the um, later on you're going to see that this painting method uh, didn't work well for me. I didn't. I don't like the amount of detail that gets covered up. Here it looks fine. I should have just stuck with this as it was, but I went in and added additional layers um, because I didn't think that there was enough coverage at the bottom there. You could still see some brass, um, but ultimately I ended up adding way too much paint. Um, the dial looks okay, but you just can't see into the details that looks nothing like the surface of the moon uh, or the lunar surface. So um, ultimately you're going to see that here in a bit. And um, what I do is I end up just remaking the dial rather than stripping the paint off. Uh, I could have stripped the paint off, but there's no reason to do that here. I'm just literally taking off the paint uh, from the areas like Barger, the, the, uh, the minute and second areas. Um, that are on there. And um, in this case, this is kind of silly because I'm not really doing too much. I'm just showing you that you don't use a lot of pressure here. I really should be using a longer piece of sandpaper. Um, but in this case, this is what I had sitting right next to me while I was doing the camera. And uh, so I just was showing with that. But I actually ended up using a longer piece on this than what I'm showing here. Um, and this is that longer piece here. Um, one of the things that's really important to do is make sure you keep your sandpaper wet and also clean it off. So um, I can't use the water, hold it, and do the sanding and hold the camera at the same time. Um, I don't have a tripod set up, so this is what you end up with. But you can see here that I sanded off some of the uh, actual areas I didn't want to be sanded. So now I'm going back with a paintbrush and adding that in. And this is where I ended up adding way, way too much paint um, to the dial and ended up, in my opinion, spoiling the dial. Um, it still has an interesting texture. It still looks like a cool looking dial, but it's definitely nothing like a lunar surface anymore. It just looks like a painted dial. So not real happy with the way that ended up turning out. Um, and I'll end up going back and redoing that dial. And this is what the dial ends up looking like when I redo it. In this case, I just used uh, black brass coloring um, chemical. Uh, it's called, uh, I think it's just called black brass or brass black. Um, and it looks fantastic inside of the case. I've added uh, green pips that glow in the dark um, for the uh, hour indices for this and um, and then this is a case that I, I've tried out. I hope you liked the video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more watch videos.